fine. Kevin thinks we should start. <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Cachin. I'm sharing this session on uh, quantum and post-quantum. Um, it must have been an unlikely outcome of the quantum algorithm that assigned me to this session, because I will learn a lot of new things. Yeah? <laughs> the first talk is, on, uh, uh, is about Beyond Quadratic Speedups in Quantum Attacks on Symmetric Schemes by Xavier Bontin, André Schrottenlohr, and Ferdinand Sibleras. And uh, Xavier is going to give the talk, please. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. So first of all, I will give a bit of context by presenting a very quick view on quantum attacks in uh, cryptography. So we can separate what is mostly three big families. The first one is the bad news where we have quantum polynomial attacks on classically secure schemes. The two most uh, notorious examples are, of course, RSA or discrete logarithm. But uh, as Maria presented this morning, this is also the case for some symmetric schemes in the Q2 model, that is, with classical queries, with quantum queries, not classical. We also have an annoying case where we have some super polynomial gain with a quantum algorithm rather compared to classical. So here, quantum computing is annoying, but is not, does not prevent to do cryptography. This is, in particular, the case for some isogeny-based schemes. And in the other cases, in the, the most common case we can see is where we have a speed up, which is at most quadratic. So this includes pretty much everything else, including, up to now, symmetric schemes, if we are restricted to classical queries. And in uh, this uh, case, we can uh, experimentally see that most of the proposed attacks are quantum improvements of classical attack. So now I will zoom a bit more on this category, and I will uh, focus more precisely in the case of symmetric schemes and of block cipher. So we know that uh, thanks to uh, Grover search, exhaustive search has a quadratic speed up quantumly compared to classically. And if we, when we do a quantum attack, the only thing we do is to accelerate some parts using Grover's algorithm, then the overall speed up we'll get will be at most quadratic. And this is actually something which can be extremely reassuring. Because if we assume that the speed up we can get with quantum computing is at most quadratic, then if for a given scheme, no classical attack beats classical exhaustive search, then we can't have any quantum attack that beats quantum ex exhaustive search. So this is a very simple <laughs> analysis, but uh, this uh, is something that could occur, for example, for block ciphers. But we also have something similar that uh, occurs in uh, the NIST com competition with some of the quantum se security level. Uh, so, of course, this is a very simple analysis. And in this talk, I will pre pre present you the first example of a symmetric construction whose gap between its classical and quantum security is actually greater than quadratic. And uh, now I will uh, begin with a sh very short uh, Disclaimer, most of the introduction of, of my work will uh, overlap with the um, Maria's invited talk of this morning. So if you slept this morning, you have a second chance to catch up on that. So first of all, I will present Simon's algorithm and uh, the attack on the environment scheme. Then I will dive into the core algorithm for our attack, which is the offline Simon's algorithm. And finally, I will present the new stuff. So first of all, I introduce to you Simon's algorithm, which is a very early quantum algorithm and a sort of predecessor of Shor's algorithm. It solves what is called Simon's problem. This is a very simple problem where we have a function f on n bits. And this function happens to be periodic. That is, there exists a, a fixed value s such that if you add it to the input, it doesn't change the output. And you, the aim of the problem is to recover this period. Classically, this reduces to collision finding, but quantumly, we can do much better thanks to Simon's algorithm. The main thing to remember about Simon's algorithm is that it requires quantum queries to the periodic function. That is, it needs to be able to compute 
given a superposition of input to the function, the superposition of the input output tuples. And from that, it can um, efficiently sample the values that are orthogonal to the period. Hence, it, it's su sufficient to repeat a linear amount of time the process and solve a linear, a linear system to recover the period. So now, how to apply that in uh, crypt analysis? I present again the even Mansour cipher, which is a very simple block cipher, arguably <laughs> the simplest block cipher. It is built from a publicly known random permutation P. And to encrypt a message X, what you do is you add the first key K1, you apply the public permutation, you add a second key, and you get your, your cipher test. And classically, this um, simple construction is proven. Any attack requires a certain amount of time and data, such that the product is at least two to the n. Now, quantumly, this is uh, very di different. There has been an attack proposed by Kiwakado and Murray in 2012, and it amounts in realizing that if you take the encryption of a message X and add to this message the image of the, of this, the same X through the public permutation, you get a periodic function. And the period of this function will be the first key. Hence, it is possible to recover this key by applying Simon's algorithm. And once you've recovered it, you've essentially broken even Mansour. Thus, Simon's algorithm allows to break the even Mansour construction in polynomial time. But now, the things we really need to have in mind is that in order for Simon's algorithm to work, we really crucially need the ability to perform quantum queries. So to, to compute the superposition of input-output tuple given a superposition of input. However, this is not the scenario we tend to see uh, at least uh, today. In general, what we have today is a large list of uh, classical plain text cipher text pairs, and we have to work with that. And this is precisely what the offline Simon's algorithm does. So now to present this algorithm, I will uh, present a slight generalization of the event monster construction which is the FX construction. It is the same, except that instead of a public permutation P in the middle, we have a block cipher indexed by a secret key K. And classically, we have a very similar time data trade-off, which is that any attack must have uh, the time data product greater or equal than N plus K. And we can have a look at some attack that matches this trade-off. There are many variants, but here I present one simple attack, which is that we first gather a large list of encryptions of many messages. Here we saw the encryption of two messages with different inputs. This is only to remove the key K2. And once we've done that once, we will uh, try to compute the, the correct inner key by testing every possible inner key. And for each candidate uh, key, we will uh, compute the encryption of a message X um, and we will <laughs> and we will draw it. And uh, we will find a collision with, with the other key. And each time we find a collision, this will give us a key both for the value of the inner key K and the first key k1 because we know that for the correct key for if we do the correct key guess and the difference between the input in the first list and the second list is equal to k1 we must have a collision and once we have a guess then it's easy to check if it's correct by using only a few more plain text cipher text now how can we attack that quantumly there has been uh, <laughs> a very sim <laughs> simple ID proposed by Leander and May in 2017, which is that if we know the inner key K, then it degenerates to an even Mansour. Hence, we can check whether the inner key is correct or not by trying to apply the previous attack. If it's correct, it's a, it's a correct guess. Otherwise, for wrong guess, it will fail. Thus, we can uh, attack this construction by doing a quantum search to apply Simon's algorithm to check whether the key is correct. And here, the, the cost will be polynomial because Simon's algorithm is polynomial times the cost of the quantum search, so two to the k over two. Now, the remark on the FX construction to go to the offline Simon's algorithm is that uh, what does the Grover meets Simon algorithm is to check for a family of functions which one is a periodic and to find the periodic function. And here, we do not have a, a random uh, periodic function. It has a very specific stru structure. 
it is the sum of a part that is secret. This is the encryption of an X. And uh, this part does not depend on the current guess on, um, of the function. And we add to this first function something that only depends on um, values we know. So the input X and the current guess for the value of the inner key. That means that during uh, the, um, the attack, what we what we do each time we do a test is to do one quantum query to the secret function with the exact same input, and then we we add some elements to obtain the, the function we want. Hence, we do exponentially many times the exact same quantum query to the exact same secret function, and uh, this seems to be a bit wasteful. And uh, indeed, we can do better than that if we change a bit the way we do the quantum attack. So first. We assume that we do before the attack all the quantum queries to the secret function. And then when we want to do our test of uh, periodicity, what we will do is to get the quantum queries, construct reversibly the, the function that we want to, to test for periodicity, test it, and then we revert all the operations to get back the, the queries and we will be then able to use them in, in the next state, in the next test and so on. So in terms of cost compared to the previous attack, it doesn't change the time because we still have uh, the same quantum search and we still apply Simon's algorithm. But in terms of the number of queries to a secret function, we drastically reduce to from an exponential number to only a linear number. And in terms of memory, we're still polynomial. However, a linear number of queries is still not zero. So we can actually completely get rid of quantum queries. For that, we need the ability to construct the quantum state that corresponds to a quantum query. And this happens to be possible if you know all the classical elements that it contains. That is, if you know the full code book of the function, then you can manually construct a quantum state that corresponds to the quantum queries. And if we do that, then we obtain an attack whose cost will be two to the n before n because we have to process all the classical queries. And we have a search cost which will be of two to the k over two up to polynomial factors. Now we can uh, actually reduce the cost uh, of the attack if, uh, if the data cost of the attack, if we guess part of the period. This will allow us to reduce the number of classical queries at the expense of increasing the size of the search space. So we have a, a nice trade-off where the setup becomes to the n minus u and the cost of the search increase in k plus u over two. So here we have uh, the comparative time data trade-off between uh, classical and quantum attack. And we can see that we have a, a nice quadratic speed up for any um, fixed amount uh, of, uh, of data. And we can remark that we have a quadratic speed up, but we have slightly more than that because quantumly we are always polynomial in memory, but classically we, we can't always be polynomial in memories. In some cases we need to, to have some. So now I will move to the new stuff, which is how can we have larger gaps than that? And for that, I need to present the extended FX constructions, which is a variant of the Tuxor cascade constructions that has already been studied in the past. It is the same as the FX construction, except that after it, we add a second call to another block cipher whose inner key is the same as the middle block cipher. And this construction has already been studied. So we know it's classical security. And as expected, it's better than for the FX construction. We still have the same time data trade-off as before. But we have an additional constraint, which is that the time can't be lower than k plus n over 2. And we can have a look at what this means in terms of attack. And uh, a matching attack for the, this bound is um, very similar to the, to the FX attack. The idea is that we want to apply the FX attack. But before looking for a collision, we first have to remove the, the second block cipher call. So that means that for all candidate keys that we, that we test, we, we first have to process all the queries we've done by inverting the second block cipher call. And then we look for a collision. 
And this means that here for, for, for this attack, contrary to the FX attack, we have to uh, process the, the queries at least once per um, keys we test. So we can no longer amortize the cost of the number of, of queries using the fact that we're testing a large number of keys. This is why when, when we look at the time data trade-off, once we reach the birthday bound, we, we, we're stuck and we can do better, better than that. So now, quantumly, what can we do? We have uh, still something that's very similar to the FX construction. So we want to apply Simon's algorithm. And here we, we need a periodic function. We can still construct a periodic function. It will be almost the same as before, except that we add the decryption of the second block cipher to obtain the, the, the period we need. So in order to be able to apply the offline Simon's algorithm, we need to have some additional properties to this function. That is, the, we, we need to, to be able to have one set of queries done once and for all. And we can still do that here because we still have the secret part, which is fixed and independent of uh, the key guess Z. And we have uh, a part that's uh, purely <laughs> publicly computable. It's no longer the sum of two, of two functions here. We first need to reversibly transform the quantum query by composing through the decryption of the second block cipher call. And then we add the encryption to the first block cipher call to recover the uh, periodic function. So with this uh, additional decryption, everything behaves exactly as for the FX attack. And so the uh, cost is actually the same up to some um, polynomial factors. And so if we have a look at the comparative classical and quantum security for extended effects, what we can see is that as long as uh, data, the amount of data is below the birthday bound, we're in the same case as for the FX construction, we have a quadratic speed up. But once we go above that, then the quantum attack continues to get better when the classical attack is stuck. Hence, in all this area, we have a gap which is later, which is greater than quadratic. So the exact gap we reach depends on the amount of data and the relative size of K and N. And the maximal gap that we can reach with this approach is actually 2.5 with um, the maximal amount of data on a key which is of size 2N. So now to, to conclude, um, on, on this attack, uh, we have uh, studied the extended FX constructions, which uh, is a construction that actually do appear in some actual crypto systems. We have some um, isostandard ISO, ISO Mac, we can be seen as an instance of that. For these constructions, the, the gap we have is tight. That is, the, um, we have a, a quantum lower bound with unlimited data for our attack, and we match it with, with our attack. And this also shows that contrary to the classical case where extended FX actually offered an increase of security compared to the FX construction, quantumly, the second block cipher call is actually useless because the security is the same. Now, if we have a look, uh, at the, at the attack. This attack demonstrates that in uh, symmetric cryptography, we can have classical quantum speedups that are more than <laughs> quadratic in the ideal models with classical queries only. For the offline assignments algorithm, we, it is not possible to, to get uh, a gap that's larger than 2.5. And a nice implication of that is that it's often said that in order to apply hidden subgroup <laughs> algorithm, uh, you need to have a strong algebraic structure. And here, the strong algebraic <laughs> structure that allows us to obtain a meaningful application is only the XOR of a secret, which is pretty neat. So now I will finish my talk with a few open questions. The first one is that uh, we only have a quantum lower bound if we do not limit the amount of, of data. We believe the attack is also tight with restricted data, but uh, this is left uh, to be done. 
The more that quadratic gap we've obtained require an amount of data which is pretty large, greater than the birthday bound. It would be interesting to see if we can do better with a lower amount of, of data. And finally, the other question would be how far can we go? Are there some other approaches that would allow for even greater gap? We conjecture that in this model, it uh, could be possible to go up to a cubic gap, but this is uh, an open question to this day. Thank you for your attention. We do have time for some questions. Please walk up to the microphones. Meanwhile, you've posted the questions yourself there. Yeah. Because this was actually my question oh. <laughs> that I also came up with. How So let me rephrase, how likely do you see it that we can go from 2.5 to 3 in the exponent or something? Well, we would need another algorithm than Simon's algorithm. So it would be hard. What would you would need, in fact, is a quantum polynomial time algorithm or sub-exponential whose classical equivalent uh, has cost 2 to the n. So if you have something that reduces to collision finding, like Shaw or Simon, I think you can't reach that. So you would need something else, okay. which is, uh, it, and it's unclear, well, we, we can reasonably think that such problem exists, but it's unclear that it would have a cryptographic application. Ah, huh, okay. <laughs> question no well then uh, we thank you again and move to the next talk okay.